we've got our first turbine inst uh, installed already and it will be generating electricity by the end of this month. Mm -hmm. uh, in the medium term, we'll have another 24 turbines following uh, during the first quarter of uh, the next year. Right. So by this time next year, we'll have 25 turbines generating 45 megawatts of uh, renewable energy. What do you make of the energy politics in South Africa where we've got a monopoly player, ESCOM, which has um, financial constraints, um, but continues to be the nucleus of how electricity will be generated in the country, and to that extent seems reluctant to work with independent power producers. Where do you fit in the continuum? Well, uh, renewable energy is fast becoming um, more uh, important uh, in terms of Kyoto and the Copenhagen agreements. South Africa has uh, committed to renewable energy, so Eskom's stance is certainly changing in that regard. And um, we are we're getting tremendous support from our president as well in this regard. Uh, you have an agreement to provide uh, electricity <coughs> to the Nelson Mandela Stadium during the FIFA World Cup tournament. Yet FIFA requirements is that all electricity provision for matches should be generator or UPS operated as opposed to just feeding off the national grid. So where do you fit in that? Okay, that's perfectly true. Uh, FIFA requirements state that uh, there has to be a generator or backup support. Um, where we fit in, we, um, we are renewable energy and we are supplying, um, we'll be supplying approximately 300,000 kilo, 300, kilowatt hours of uh, electricity to the Nelson Mandela Stadium for the uh, duration of the games at no charge. And um, that is um, our way of giving something back to the country, but also it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for South Africa to demonstrate to the world that we are moving in the correct and the, the right direction in terms of renewable energy by powering the Nelson Mandela Stadium. You know, the reason why FIFA's asked for generators is because they don't want any interrupted power supply. How can you guarantee that yours will be regular and consistent? We can't guarantee that because, you know, our electricity is only generated when, when the wind blows. So, um, but the, the, the advantage is, of course, that uh, being in Port Elizabeth, it's not called the Windy City for nothing. Right. What about your expansion into the rest of the uh, SADC region? We know that your plans are to be active in SADC by 2014. We currently... Um, have, we, we're negotiating business dealings in both Namibia and in Mauritius. In Namibia, we already have our license from the Electricity Control Board, or the regulator, for a wind farm in, uh, in Walfish Bay. We have a wind measuring mast that's being erected currently in the Walfish Bay area. We will be hopefully erecting uh, 50 megawatts of power in Walfish Bay. Um, in, in Mauritius, we'll be doing a, 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 co a co collective um, uh, solution in, with wind and biomass mm -hmm. uh, for Mauritius. The other, the other areas in SADC, um, you must remember their, their, their grids are far smaller than ours and um, one has to be very careful when you introduce renewable energy that uh, mm -hmm. their grids can actually handle. That, uh, that new energy source. Let's talk about integrated solutions. Obviously, mm -hmm. wind uh, energy has worked really well in countries like Germany and just generally in Europe because of the climatic conditions. Africa's comparative advantage or competitive advantage is the heat, the sun. But we also know that uh, introducing solar panels and the technology required is very, very expensive. It and is. So people are quite reticent to move in that direction. Are you looking at an integrated option in terms of the work that you're doing? Yes, we are very much so. Um, we the, the 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 two main uh, solar solutions are PV and uh, CSP, concentrated solar power. We're looking at concentrated solar power um, as a good solution um, in the area around Uppington and the Orange River because they have the probably the best sunlight in the world there. Um, also, there is water available, which is needed for concentrated solar power. Um, the combination of um, what we call an energy valley is something that we're aspiring to in this country as well. It's becoming popular in Europe, where you have a combination of wind, solar, and biomass. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you are able to give constant power all the time using those three technologies. All right, now the other hat that you wear is uh your role as chairman of the Trade and Investment Committee in the Durban Chamber of Commerce. Now, yes. Durban doesn't spring to mind as the foremost investment destination in South Africa and usually overshadowed by Johannesburg and Cape Town. Uh, Cape Town. <laughs> and in fact, even in terms of barometer studies, the Eastern Cape seems to get more attention than KwaZulu-Natal. What are you doing to fix that? Well, the Durban Chamber uh, is 150 years, 154 years old now. It's the largest chamber in Africa. Um, with 3,500 members. It's becoming more and more active in the arena. It's uh, promoting inbound missions 
to invest in South Africa, in particular in the Durban area. And um, we, we believe that uh, from a Chamber's perspective, the, uh, the Durban area is, is an area of great potential growth. Bear in mind too that um, our port is, is the busiest yeah. in the country. So we have a fantastic infrastructure for both import and export. All right, now the port is the busiest in the country, but it's been crippled right now by the Transnet strike. And one of the um, issues to emerge from the Transnet strike is the fact that the harbour is not as big as everybody thought it was, mm. and the uh, warehousing facilities aren't as uh, vast by way of capacity as everybody had thought it was. This is why the shipping industry is losing close on to two uh, million US dollars per day, per day just by virtue of this strike. So in terms of upgrading facilities um, and making the port a little bit more feasible outside of striking conditions, mm. what are you doing? Okay, we are supporting Transnet uh, in, in that initiative. There is, a, there is an enormous amount of investment going into the port. Um, the, the, first, the first stage of the investment was uh, the widening of the harbour mouth. Uh, the second stage is um, the uh, at attention to the berths itself and then obviously along with that will be the warehousing facilities. So we're realising that we have to grow uh, along as time goes by because uh, we don't want to be left behind mm -hmm. and uh, we're very conscious of it and Chamber is certainly lending its, throwing its weight right. behind it. You also have a voice in the National Exporters Advisory Body at a time when the RAND has been quite volatile. Mm -hmm. It's now somewhere within the 7.5% uh, 7.5 RANDs to the dollar range and there is a call, an increasingly loud call for fair value to be 850 in order to push up exports. What's your view on this one? Well, look, we, we go along with that view, um, f especially from an export point of view. Um, but the one thing that we, we've got to consider, and that is that South Africa and Africa as a, a, as a whole, we are net exporters of raw materials. And we have to re remember that every time we're exporting raw materials, we're exporting jobs. So what we are doing as chambers, we are inspiring entrepreneurs, SMMEs in particular, to become more active in the field of manufacture and adding value to raw material, adding value to, uh, to the stage of a, of a completed item or a semi-completed item to cut down the amount of uh, raw materials that are being exported. And this, of course, will lead to job creation, which is what we need so badly.